this problem is not going to disappear. It's going to get bigger. And it won't be streets. It'll be whole cities. It will be whole towns. Because you cannot live. It's not enough. No one makes enough money to live in these types of stuff. I'm talking about people with cars, people with jobs. They said they're a step away from where I'm living. In our culture, homelessness is kind of that invisible individual. <laughs> you know, people walk by, they don't even see them, don't even acknowledge. I mean, that's not just for seniors, that's any homeless person. People don't want to see that there's that type of thing out there. Uh, so they become invisible. There is no one-fits-all reason for why folks are homeless. Um, a lot of it, I believe, has to do with uh, the crisis we had back in 2008. A lot of folks lost their life savings in the stock market, 401ks, etc. And it just, everybody thinks uh, living in Phoenix would be easy when you're homeless. And it's not, of course. Why, why would they think that? They read the newspaper and about the nice temperatures and, you know, propaganda. Well, the, the homeless are just like the rest of us. Uh, they want to move to someplace nice and, you know, it's nice here in the winter, uh, not so nice in the summer. Like when I hear that people come to Arizona to be homeless, on purpose? Seriously, like that's your plan. It's not a plan. Phoenix, Arizona, a lot of folks gravitate here because of the nice weather. I see a lot of people come in from all over the country because of our weather, um, but there's no one fits all. It can be mental health, um, substance abuse, um, just not preparing for their uh, golden years. This place was founded by a Methodist pastor, uh, plus a gentleman by the name of Michael, who's on staff, who was a homeless person. And he and Miriam were the three that felt there needed to be something for the seniors because what they found was oftentimes the seniors in the shelters are abused by the younger people that are in the shelters. Uh, their stuff gets stolen. Uh, Scott Ritchie, who was the pastor, felt there needed to be a place where seniors could be at least for a few hours of the day, a place where they were t treasured and treated as human beings, and a place of safety, and a place where there was help to move them forward, to move them out of homelessness into being housed. We see anywhere between 120 to 150 daily here because most seniors never expected to ever truly be in the position they're in. With seniors, 
especially with our economy the way it's been, oftentimes Social Security is not enough to live on. Um, you know, if you have, you know, some of our members get like only $700 a month, and most of the apartments around here are 1200 so there's no way, how can they get into a place with what that is and, and still live, still exist? I really had, a until I got down working here, I had a completely different opinion of uh, the homeless because I thought so many of them you know, chose to, and, and some do choose to, but some would rather not that choice. They don't see any other choice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, either mentally ill, you know, where they need some help, and with a little help, they could get off the streets. Some of our members are, uh, have mental issues, which makes it hard for them to hold a job. They also, um, a lot of our uh, uh, SMI, uh, a lot of them come off of drugs, addictions of one sort or another. Another one of our problems is we have a lot of folks with mental health issues um, that are untreated and uh, there's just nowhere for them to go. Here, they become people <laughs> that are loved and cared about. That's why we call them members and not clients, because we want them to feel like they're part of a family here. So you know, they, can, they feel like they are a human being again and not just something that people walk by. So, you know, what I realize is that there's just such a need out there for people to just help people. You know, food is really important, but just to have someone, you know, help them fill out forms because maybe they don't have glasses to see as well, or or they they have some mental issues that kind of help hinder them from filling out things. Um, um, other people, you know, lady, uh, her husband, well, could have been a common law husband. He died at a Circle K. They'd been living in his truck. They never got married. They'd been living together for 20 years. She won't get his social security, won't get his military. Um, so we had to sell her truck on eBay. Um, these people have been trying to get housing. Section 8 housing, which is for very low income housing. Some facilities quit taking waiting lists because it's over a year. So these people have no place to go. The homeless population, it just it really balloons in the winter for, for good reason. Mm -hmm. um, and I would sure wish that there, you know, I think there's certainly, uh, the need for homeless Section 8 housing is massive. So it is such a conundrum, but what I really think needs is more humans <laughs> to interact. You know, don't just write a check. Go sit down, go talk to someone. You know, listen to their story and say, hey, you know what, sometimes they, it just an encouraging, hey, you know what, do this. Here's a place, Justice Center's got some clothes, you know. It just, they need encouragement. They, uh, and, and, uh, and I think when, when a person helps someone one-to-one, -one, it helps that person being helped, helps maintain their dignity. And that's the biggest problem. Here, have a check, you know, here, here get this food and, and, and go away. Uh, I've been you know. working here at the Justice Center for, uh, uh, almost six years now. I'm, I'm 76, uh, so I should be retired and laying on a beach in Hawaii, but I would. And the reason I work here is um, I have a thing about uh, people being homeless, uh, especially veterans and especially people over 55. When I was, uh, just before I was 16, 
I ran away from home and um, I wound up spending a few nights in the Fifth Street Mission in Miami, Florida. So I know what it's like to be hungry. Um, when you're 16, it's easy. When you're 55, it's not so easy because it's an expensive place to live. Most of our people here um, make less than $1,000 a month on Social Security. A lot of people make the minimum, which is 750 or whatever. Yeah, you can. Uh, I think in Phoenix, uh, uh, rents are like 1500 That's, you know, a month. So you don't have a chance. A lot of the problem is that there's not enough um, senior housing out there. Um, we're in a shortage of housing, affordable housing. I um, have a lot of folks that are on waiting lists, but some of those waiting lists, it could be one to five years. Um, here in Phoenix, since we have such a large growth in population, um, rents are getting higher and higher, and they want folks to have two and a half, three times the rent amount to um, move in. And a lot of our folks are living on a fixed income, and they just can't afford that. The reason why all these people well, have not come people to living on the streets, they gave up. John Kennedy? Everything they tried, they don't work. And, and the they said, well, what about this and what about that? I said, it's good. It's like putting, as far as it is, milk on the ulcer. It's going to slow it down and stop it for a minute. I said, but then the next day, you're going to have the same pain again. You know, so they do what they can to keep people happy and sedated. You look, there's no racism down here. Everybody sits together because everybody's in the same type of condition. And the thing is, the last thing you can let go is your mind. You cannot let your mind go for no circumstance. Yeah, I'm hot. Yeah, I'm thirsty. Yeah, I got no place to go, but I got a job. I've been on the streets for 17 years or longer. No matter how much money I save up, it's not going to be enough to get a place. And they said, when I do get a place, my child support raises. The taxes go all crazy and stuff like that. They want the money for the taxes. So you got to tell child support, okay, well, this is that, this is that. I give you the money for the taxes. You ain't never going to have enough. They said, what happens if you work two jobs? You kill yourself for nothing. You never get caught up. You will never get caught up. They asked me, why don't you just go on the streets and stay there forever. I said, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna do that. I said, I can work. I can still function. I says, I still have a mind that is capable of being productive to society. Even though I don't have a place, I still work. I said, you see, most of these people down here have bicycles. You gotta get somewhere, you won't get something to eat. You can't depend on that bus. Cause a lot of times if your hygiene is not correct, you ain't riding no bus. They won't let you work. Not only will they not let you on, they will pass you. They get used to you. The drivers get to know who you are on a basis of this. Uh, my name's Richard. I grew up in West Virginia. I've been out here since, in Arizona since uh, 86. I met Amy when we were out there in our addiction. We were both addicted to meth. Um, we got married in 2011. While we, were, while we were clean, we were clean for about a year before then. We got married, and we stayed clean for about another year, year and a half. Um, then we decided one weekend um, to get high again, and that lasted a year and a half. Um, we lost everything. We, during that year and a half, uh, we had a house. We lost all our furniture. We lost our two cars. Two cars. <laughs> um, we lost our uh, place where we've been living for the past year. We moved into uh, an extended stay hotel. We um, were there for like six or seven months. Six or seven months. Which is pretty good if you think about like being out there like in your addiction. Like yeah. we managed to like scrape we, it together every we month. We scraped or... together enough money to stay, um, be a means of borrowing from friends, family. Liar. Whatever. Dirt. We did uh, dirt we, we to went, come up with did, it every week. We did go out and we did um, um, get in some uh, legal trouble. <laughs> Once we got clean the second time, we decided 
I decided myself, she decided herself, we were done. I didn't want it anymore, don't need it anymore. Um, but before then, the, ho the homelessness, the not having a place to stay, uh, we lost our extended stay hotel, so we were hotel hopping. Um, I would stand on the, the corner by the freeway uh, to try to get us enough money for uh, a hotel room. When you're using, you tend to stay in packs, right? Because, like, that's what you do. But we were, you know, like, getting hotels with, like, friends and doing that. And she would be, like, running around doing dirt with other people. And then that, like, landed us at, like, 52nd Street at the Motel 6. And we were, like, straight stranded. We didn't have a pot to piss and a window to throw it out of and, or an idea how to, like, get out of it. So that was when he was, I don't know, something switched in you to where you were just like, okay, I have to do something to, for you and I to be on our own. So that was him standing out there with a sign every day to get room money for 12 hours, if you're lucky. So it's usually $45 a night, so you stand on the corner till you get $45. And being the frugal shopper that Amy is, she always had a coupon. Uh, which so saved us five dollars, so we always had that extra money to eat, be it hot dogs, baked beans, or we were probably one of the only homeless couples out there that had a um, microwave, a microwave <laughs> and and a crock pot, and that saved us many times. I think part of the scariest part about being homeless, um, when he mentioned that we didn't have a place to go, like it, my stomach clenched. You mean like just even thinking about that, not having like a place like even a home base. You mean like nowhere to like lay your head, nowhere to call your own, just always having to be on the mode. I don't 16. think I could have been homeless in the summertime. Like I mean like, I mean if you're homeless, you're homeless. You mean you don't get to pick your season, but like to be, I mean like if there's like, uh, you know, a this or that kind of situation, the wintertime sucks, but like the summertime would suck. There's nowhere to hide from. We went to Cass once to meet, he's a veteran, so going to Cass to see if we could get veteran housing. And we did end up um, for like six months. Yeah. We wound up in an apartment that the um, ceiling fell down. Well, yeah, but I don't remember what organization <laughs> it was that put us uh, in there. Um, the U.S. Vets. Yes, and, um, but they didn't follow through. Do you mean they just put you in the apartment, but there's no follow through to make sure that you're doing okay, that you're finding work, that you're doing anything. It was just, you know, like here, and then we're in our addiction. So, like, it was a constant fight of, well, you will get a job. No, you will get a job. No, you will get a job. No, you will get a job. And then it was just, like, all we did was fight. So, like, but then the literally, like, three days into our stay at the apartment, the ceiling caved in the hallway. And uh, <laughs> because the lady above us was a heroin addict and overdo overflowed her bathtub. And it rained, and I walked out of our bedroom, and I'm like, it's raining in the hallway. Like, no joke. And he goes, what? And I'm like, I'm not even high. Like, it's raining in the hallway. And it was. And the apartment complex just didn't, they didn't care. They came and took the wet down, but they never fixed it. So, like, you expect us to pay $600 a month for an apartment where I can see, like, my neighbor's floor? Like, seriously, they just didn't care. We went to U.S. Vets again, but the one on Grand, and asked, you know, do you have a place that we could stay? Do you mean, because we really don't have anywhere to go. And they said no. And I remember being in the lobby crying. I'm like, we don't have anywhere to go. We don't have anywhere to go. We don't have any plan. Like, we have no money. Like, what are we going to do? And I don't know why that time it upset me when we had been in that exact same position. Do you know what I mean? Like, countless times. And we walked and fought until we got to 27th at Indian School. And I sat behind, I'll never forget it, I sat behind the dumpster just bawling my eyes out and I just said, Lord, please help. I can't do this anymore. I need help. And we got the thing. And we went to CBI. I remember telling you on the way, I said, I just want to be a normal old married couple who like goes to work and comes home. That's what we are now. Where I again got another job with a moving company where I work today and God um, is good. God is good. The company is uh, a really good company to work for. The owner is a recovering addict, 
and a lot of people that are in the office are recovering addicts. And I'm not talking one or two years, I'm talking 20, 30 years. So we know that it's possible to stay clean and sober, which we are planning on with God's help, um, to stay this way. Dream every night, but now it's not a nightmare, it's good dreams. And some people, it's like they're just out there for so long that they just don't know yeah. how to function. How to be a normal functioning member of yeah. society. Well, I mean, you're out there, there's no way you can get a job. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't have a address to fill, put on your application. If you have a phone, it's an Obama phone that only has so many minutes, and usually by the 10th day, 5th day of the month, you're out of minutes yeah, anyways. Yeah. Uh, so there's no way they can get a hold of you. And if you have clean clothes, you're lucky. Yeah. I mean, we did laundry at the hotel, but we were one of the fortunate ones. That... Well, I think because we had a normal life before. Yeah. <laughs> like, we had a normal life before, and we knew, like, I remember once asked, um, we were at this one apartment, remember in Peoria, and, and he asked me, he goes, what are we having for dinner? And this guy goes, you're having dinner? He goes, you cook, you eat? And Richard's like, I think the more important question is that you don't. He's like, yes, you have to eat. Because I think we were there probably getting drugs. And he was like, he goes, no, I don't eat. Richard's like, you have to, you have to eat and you have to sleep. Very random. Yes. Definitely blessed. I know, Richard, you would out, be out there flying the sign, but was that a common thing that people would fly a sign mm -hmm. for a room, or was it mostly no, just it's not drugs? No, drugs. Yeah. And I got chased away from corners before. <laughs> there, was this, there was this one older, older guy. I mean, it's nuts. He had a he had a cane or a golf club. Yeah. He, he chased me with a golf club. That's my corner. That's my corner. <laughs> but like when we were out there, if you get tight with the group, do you mean like they'll rob you blind and take care of you at the same time? Do you mean like but like they do tend to like stick together? I don't know now. I I wouldn't make it now because it's so like so scary out there now. To get that that mentality, hey, we're all in the same boat. It's all leaking. We got to keep paddling. You know, keep paddling, keep bailing. You know, because it, it, you know, life is one train wreck after another. It's just how you, you know, what's your attitude when you stand up after it happens? You have a positive outlook, I guess, on the homeless situation in Phoenix. No, uh, it's going to get worse. Don't give up hope because. God is all you have, first of all, and then you second of all. You really can't trust anybody. You have to learn, you have to dig from within. You have to find the resources because no one's going to share with you nothing. So I tell people this, stay strong, stay motivated. Most of all, you know, just trust in God because it's all you got anyways. It's astounding how uh, resilient people can be if given some help where there's a human touch.